I did deliveries for a popular fast food place in my town. During the end of my high school years, my friends all had jobs there too, but they purposefully scheduled us on separate shifts to prevent us from goofing off it, ruined all the fun. But the money was still nice to have, mostly. I would have no interesting stories about my work days. But this one night was an outlier. It was the weekend and I was working until 10. The orders were coming in steady, so I was doing deliveries one after the other. I was going in, grabbing the bag, driving to the house, and repeating that process. Non-stop, I think it was around 9 when I got this order, but I can't say for sure, because I was kind of mindlessly running the deliveries. At this point, I got the bag, and pulled up the GPS location for the address, then started driving halfway through the drive. I realized this was taking me in a different direction than usual. I'd been this way before, but there weren't a ton of houses over here, so most orders would be in the other direction. I drove, not thinking too much of it, until I saw on the GPS that I was one minute away looking around. I didn't know a single place I could be. One minute away from, there was nothing but trees, and the road, no houses or shops, literally nothing. Regardless, I drove until the GPS said I'd arrived, which was just a quarter mile further down. I pulled off to the side and did one quick look around, just in case I was missing something. Then I called the customer. The phone rang for a while before they finally picked up. Hey, I drove to the address you put in, but it doesn't seem to be right. Can you please confirm the address, I asked, hoping he just made a typo or something. He repeated the address back to me, but it was the same as the one I had in my GPS. Then he said something I wasn't expecting. Wait, I think I see you. I looked up ahead and down the road. There was a person waving at me. I drove up next to him, but I had a bad feeling in my gut. I rolled the window down and he immediately started apologizing, saying the address was tricky to find. Sometimes he pointed behind him, saying his house was down that road. This road he was referring to looked more like a half-beaten dirt walking trail that went through the forest. I smiled and said it was all right, handing him the bag through the window. He smiled back and thanked me watching me as I pulled back onto the road and did a U-turn. I looked at my mirror at the man still standing on the side of the road and just thought to myself about how strange that was. Not even a minute into the drive, though, something started to feel wrong. My car was bumpy and leaning to the right, and it was getting increasingly worse by the second it started to feel dangerous to even drive, so I had to pull over before doing anything else. I called roadside assistance. I didn't know what was wrong yet or if it had anything to do with that man, but like I said, I had a bad feeling in my gut, and I wasn't taking any chances after getting off the phone with them. I got out and looked at my tires. My front right tire was busted, and that was the tire closest to where the man was standing. So I put two and two together pretty quick. I looked back down the road where I came, and in the distance, I saw a figure walking toward me, hurried into my car and locked the doors. He approached slowly, probably knowing the exact situation I was in. As the man got closer and closer, I contemplated whether or not to risk driving on my busted tire, but by some miracle a truck came down the road and stopped behind me. They got out and asked if I was okay. I saw the man walking quickly back the way he came. I took this opportunity to tell the man from the truck of my suspicions, and he stayed there with me until the roadside assistance truck came, which was only a minute later I got the police involved, and I wasn't surprised to find out that the name and address the man ordered with was fake. I don't know what he was trying to do, but making me drive all the way out on an empty road hidden by the forest makes me think it would have been more than just a robbery. When I was 17, I worked at my mom and dad's local restaurant. We were never a busy place, but it was enough to get us by. I ran the cash register and occasionally would help out waiting tables and cleaning. 
my parents were really nice about giving me flexible hours whenever I needed for school or whatever. The summer, though, I'd be working full 40-hour weeks, typically from the afternoon until closing. This was my second year working there, and during the last half of summer, my parents had me do the closing tasks for most nights. I'd be there for maybe 15 to 30 minutes after restaurant hours to count the money and clean up. It wasn't difficult or anything, but it was just a tiny bit of extra responsibility anyway. On this Friday night, my dad and I had a somewhat busier night than usual. We were the only two workers there. Aside from the assistant cook at closing, my dad helped me out for a few minutes, then locked up the front doors and left. For the night, I had plans with a friend after work, so I was rushing to get everything done when I finished. It was a few minutes past 11. I walked out the back door, which led to a small employee parking lot, but I was taken back when I saw some guy right next to my car. He was looking through my windows, like he was trying to see what was inside. Hey, get away from my car. He looked over at me, showing his face for a split second, then ran into the trees behind the parking lot. I didn't see him long enough to get a good look, but the only feature I could really make out was his long, unkempt and patchy beard. He was a freaky looking guy and I was feeling really uneasy as I drove away. A couple days passed and on this night it was just me and the assistant cook working the closing shift. It was a weekday so it was slow but just 20 minutes before closing a guy walked through the door, sat at a table without saying anything. Now this was one of those restaurants where you go up to the register first to order then sit down, so this was kind of weird. I waited for a few minutes until I walked up to his table and asked if he'd like to order anything before we closed. It was then that I saw his long, patchy beard and recognized him as the guy from the other night. I was so caught up in my thoughts, I didn't hear his response. I tried to tell him to leave, but I stuttered, and it came out with zero confidence and assertiveness. He looked me in the eyes and asked for a dark roast coffee, completely. Ignoring what I said, I turned around and put the order in. I thought maybe this was all a misunderstanding somehow, but I'm pretty sure that was just me lying to myself to make me feel less scared of him. He sat at the table staring ahead until his coffee was ready. I walked it over to him and reminded him that the place closed in ten minutes, so he'd have to leave soon. Of course, he didn't respond. So I walked away. I went up to the assistant cook, who I never really talked to before, and told him about this guy and my uneasy feelings. I got from him. He patted me on the shoulder and said to get started on cleaning for him. Then he went to the front. I watched from over the counter as he nicely told the guy to leave. The man got up and made brief eye contact with me from across the restaurant, then turned around and walked to the door. I watched him leave, and as he extended his arm to push the door open, a very easily recognizable object was revealed. A gun wedged in the back of his belt. I thanked the cook and told him everything in more detail so he understood my concerns. He called the police without even hesitating, and while they didn't find the guy, he never came back to the restaurant. I'm grateful for our assistant cook, who I'm keeping anonymous for his own privacy. He could have easily just left for the night and let me deal with my own problems. But his kindness likely saved my life that night. When this happened, I was 23 and worked full-time at a pizza shop in my local area. I'm not sure if things were going on before this, but as far as I know, everything started and ended on this one night. Me and my best friend Tim worked the night shifts at this pizza place. It was a real small shop having just three or four tables inside because we specialized in delivery and takeout. Both me and Tim got our jobs there while we were in college, but just never left being in a quiet, rural town. Two, the job wasn't too much work, never had busy days really, just a steady flow of order. Sometimes on this night, there was a light storm outside and in return business was slow. There were a few orders here and there, but overall we didn't have much to do by 10pm. 
Tim suggested we started cleaning up the place and maybe even clocking out 15 minutes early. I went with it, grabbing some rags to wipe the tables with, when the phone at the front desk rang. I picked up after a few rings. How can we help you today? Hello? I waited another five seconds before putting the phone down and shaking my head. Just some prank call. I thought I went back to scrubbing the tables, but at the front of the store I saw a glare coming from the window. There was a car parked a few spots back. I couldn't see too well through the window in the rain, but there was definitely a light on in the car, like a cell phone or something. The pizza shop was on an individual lot. There were no other cars, so that was the only reason I noticed them. A moment later the phone rang again. Tim was closer, so he picked up. This time I could hear someone's muffled voice coming from the phone, and after a short talk, Tim hung up. At the same time, the light in the car turned off and they drove away. I told Tim what I saw and how it was a little weird, but he shrugged and said it was just some old man who was ordering a pizza for delivery. I looked back at the now empty parking lot. It wouldn't make much sense for someone to order a pizza for delivery from right outside the shop. So I figured Tim was right, and it was nothing. He started making the pizza while I continued cleaning. Ten minutes later, Tim boxed it up and handed it off to me to deliver. I ran through the rain to my car, then pulled up the address on my phone. Eleven minutes away, not too bad. I pulled out and started making my way there. The roads were dead. Nobody out at all. Google Maps took me down to a neighborhood full of large homes, then had me turn down a long driveway that led to a cul-de-sac, where there were three more driveways, each leading to a different house. I went down the one Maps told me to and pulled up next to the home. It was one of those large, expensive houses, but pretty old-looking and not very modern at all. Parked the car and double-checked the address with the house number, then picked up the pizza and ran up to the front door. Hello, pizza delivery. I took a step back and looked at the front of the house. All of the lights were off. I dialed him cell and had him call the guy who ordered my phone buzzed the moment later, and Tim told me that his call went straight to voicemail. I shook my head in frustration and ran back through the rain to my car and got in. I tossed the pizza on the passenger seat and started backing out. This wasn't out of the ordinary, getting fake orders or dead deliveries, but it still annoyed me every time. When I got back, Tim was cleaning and said there were no more orders so we were good to finish up and head out. I tossed the pizza in the trash and started helping him. Both of us were in the back, cleaning the ovens and wiping the prep counters, when a sudden bang came from the front of the building. We looked at each other, then ran to the front. At first, we didn't see anything, but then Tim spotted a small crack on the door. I walked over and opened it, and right outside was a heavy rock big enough to throw and do some damage with. I looked around, seeing the parking lot was completely empty and nobody was nearby. Both of us were really confused, and kind of freaked out. We talked about maybe calling the cops, but neither of us wanted to deal with that right now. To put things in perspective, it was ten minutes before we were off, and if we called, then we'd be here for another hour, at least. The crack on the door wasn't too big, not really that noticeable, so we chose to wait and just tell our manager the next day. Instead, we quickly finished up with the cleaning and left through the back door where our cars were parked on the drive home. I rethought all the strange things that happened, and it made me uneasy. I pulled into my driveway and walked inside. It was late, so I knew I had to get in bed soon, but I wanted something to snack on. First, I went to the kitchen to see what I had, but the butt before I even opened the pantry, I heard a car splash through the puddles on the street outside my house from the sound of it. I could tell it was parking. I walked over to my window and peeked outside, seeing a car parked right in front of my driveway. It only took me a second to realize it was the same car I'd seen outside the pizza shop. Cold rush went through me and I stayed in the window to see what they were doing. 
The car was still on, but I couldn't see through their window. After a minute of no movement, I took out my phone and called Tim, telling him that I think one of the customers followed me home and was parked right outside my house. Are you serious? You need to call the cops. Something's not right, he said, urging me to hang up and call the police immediately. I don't know why I was so nervous to call the cops, but hearing Tim say it made me feel better about it. I moved away from the window and dialed 911. The lady on the line said that they would have someone on their way and that I should stay hidden and wait. I heard a car door open and close, so I quickly said, okay, and hung up. Looking back out the window, a man was walking up my driveway. He was wearing dark clothes, covering his whole body in a hood, covering his face as he approached the house. I closed the curtains by the window and waited. Footsteps came to the front door. Then they continued across the front of the house until they reached the outside of the window and stopped the sudden silence, made the sound of the rain increasingly louder. I felt like I was standing there quietly for minutes before I stepped forward and moved the curtain an inch to the side, just enough to peek through the man's cold eyes, stared back at me. I let go of the curtain and the man banged on the window. I stood a few feet away, terrified to death, and just as quick as it started, it ended. There was no more banging, no footsteps, nothing. All that was left was the sound of the raindrops clicking against the window. Although I never heard the man leave, he was gone when the police showed up. No car or man in sight. I told them all that had happened from the middle of my shift to the end of the night. They looked at me like I was crazy and part of me felt crazy too. None of it made any sense and there didn't seem to be any motive for the man to have done what he did, honestly. Because of that, the whole night had me messed up for a while going through something as senseless as that was really just with my head. I'm hoping that by sharing this, someone may be able to help me understand what happened or why the man did. What he did sounds odd, but even now when it gets really quiet on rainy days, there's an eerie feeling that rushes through me bringing me back to that night. Thank you, I used to shop at Target all the time, but recently I don't want to go back there. At least not to the location that I live. My creepy and weird things happen to me. There was really only one Target that's close to where I live. It's been my main store for years to get just about anything. There's some other stores that I go to as well, but Target has the best variety. I've always preferred it over Walmart as well. One night I went shopping after work. I was getting a lot of items, mainly groceries. I got a cart and began shopping around the store. It wasn't all that busy and that made things go smoothly after shopping for probably about 30 minutes. I was almost done. My cart had lots of items in it, and I was in the last area of the store that I would be going to, which was the cold section. The refrigerated items and the freezer items is what I would always get last. That way, they wouldn't melt by the time I got home. When I got to that section of the store, it was empty. It was the only person there. They had a freezer at the back of the store, and I was getting something from it. I saw something strange. It was like movement of some sort behind the items. This particular freezer section was up against the very back of the store, leading to the back room. That's when I realized that a person was back there behind the freezer shelves. I could see between the levels of shelves that they had, but not by much. Somebody was right behind the spot. That I was, at first, I thought it was kind of funny, but I soon realized it wasn't a Target employee. I moved down to get something else, and whoever was there seemed to move down with me as I was examining a product. I could see that the person was wearing black, not the typical red shirt and khakis that a Target employee would wear. Then they got closer, and I noticed that I could now see their head through the gap between the shelves. The person was wearing a black ski mask. My only thought was that this was really strange. I moved even further down, and the masked man moved down with me. 
He was beginning to really freak me out. He kept staring at me from the other side. Luckily, for me, I only needed one more item from that aisle. I went to grab it as the masked man stared at me. Then, as I was reaching for the product, the guy reached over and shoved the whole box of them at me. Multiple items fell onto the floor, put them back, as he disappeared into the freezer. This guy was causing problems, and I decided to tell an employee about him. Down a few aisles before finding somebody who worked there, I told them about the guy and how he was inside of the freezer. The employee told me that she would tell the person to leave and that they couldn't be back there. There happened to be doors leading to the back room of the store right nearby, and I watched her walk through them about a minute later. The employee emerged again. She told me that she couldn't find anybody back there at all. Whoever had been doing that must have left. I hadn't seen anybody else come out of the doors. Though I shrugged it off and was done with my shopping, so I decided to head out. I walked up to the front and paid for everything, then left the store about a week later. I returned. I would say that I went grocery shopping roughly once a week. I didn't have a specific day or anything like that that I would go, but on average it was probably about once. This time that I went back to the Target was just like any other. I did all my shopping in about 30 minutes or so, and then checked out with all my items. After I left the store, I walked out to my car and unloaded the groceries into it. Then I started driving home. This particular Target has several other businesses around it, like just past the parking lot. There was also a few trees and bushes around for scenery. As I was driving away, leaving the parking lot, I was driving between some other businesses and the Target parking lot going to a connecting road. That's when I saw the same guy dressed in all black and a ski mask. He was halfway hiding behind a bush, and he popped out and looked directly at me as I drove away. I drove right past him in disbelief. This was the same guy who I had seen last time. I had been at the same target, but this time he was outside, not inside the store. It was crazy to me how I specifically saw him. Maybe he just liked to go to Target and mess with people I really didn't know. But what I did know is that I was really weirded out by this. The way he was hiding in the bushes was concerning. Luckily, I was away from him now, and on the way home after that experience, I didn't go, I didn't go to Target for almost two weeks when I returned. It was just another routine shopping trip. Just like any other, I did my shopping, like always, and then left the store. It was nighttime again, and things were pretty quiet. Inside and outside of the Target, I had parked sort of in the middle of the parking lot, about halfway back. There were a few other cars around mine when I got back to my car. I unloaded the groceries again, and got inside. I started my engine, and was just about ready to drive away. I happened to glance over at the car that was parked directly next to me to the left, for no particular reason when I glanced over, though I noticed movement. It caught my attention and my eyes stayed focused on it. The entire car had looked empty to me. The car was a standard-looking white sedan, and the back windows were tinted dark, but the front windows I could see through. That's when somebody emerged from the back seat, crawling over into the front passenger seat. It was a guy wearing all black and a ski mask. My jaw dropped when I saw this. He looked right at me through the windows separating us. He continued to stare at me for probably five seconds or so as I sat there, in total shock. Then his door started to open. I was so surprised still from just seeing the guy that I didn't do anything. It was like I couldn't move. After he opened the door, he stood up and reached for my driver's door. I finally came to my senses and hit the lock switch just moments later. The man with the mask tried opening my driver's door, which had just locked. He then leaned in very closely to my driver's window, basically pressing his face against it. I was beyond creeped out. He stared right at me as close as he possibly could. I yelled at him to go away, but he didn't move. Put my car into reverse and then started backing out. The guy grabbed onto my car as I backed away. 
he was trying to stay with me, and when I had backed out and began driving, he finally let go. I saw him then run back to the car that he had been inside. I hit the gas, harder to leave as soon as possible. I was able to make it out of the parking lot, and I quickly turned off to a busier street. After that, I quickly turned into another parking lot, and then turned my lights off and parked. I watched, and several seconds later, I saw a car come out of the Target parking lot and drive quickly down the street past me. I was pretty sure that that was the guy after the car was long gone. I was able to drive home and I made it back. Okay, this wasn't all that long ago, each of the last three times I went to that Target. I've seen the same man. Why is he there and what is he doing? I really don't know. I haven't been back to that Target. Since background of this story, I'm a female, and I worked at Target for a while, over a year ago. The Target that I worked at was very close to my apartment at the time, and it was a pretty enjoyable job for me. My favorite part was talking with co-workers and becoming friends with them. Mostly what I would do is work in the clothing department. I would do all sorts of things there, and it wasn't very stressful, because things usually don't get busy, like they do in the grocery section. At the time of this story, I had been working there for almost four months. I remember it very well. It all started on a typical day at work. I was in the clothing department, particularly the women's section, straightening up items that were out of place. It was during the daytime, and the store was calm. This is when a tall man approached me, assuming he was a customer who had a question about something. I greeted him, asking how I could help. The man stood there looking directly at me, with a somewhat creepy grin on his face. For a moment he then said, Yes, you can help me by going out with me tonight. I laughed it off, I had no interest in going out with a man, but I wasn't scared of him or anything. I just told him that I had a boyfriend, even though I didn't actually have one. This was always the best way to tell off a guy that I wasn't interested in. In my experience, the man replied rather quickly, saying, No, you don't. I told him that I did, and I asked the man if he needed help finding anything. He then responded with an even creepier reply. Yes, directions to your house. I laughed off this remark as well. I was just hoping that the man was joking around because this was getting really weird after he said that. I told him that I had a lot of work to do and I told him to have a good day. Then I started making my way to another section of the large clothing department that we had. The clothing area was practically big enough to get lost in, was hoping to lose sight of the man. But when I started moving away, he followed and I admitted to another section and he was still next to me. I stopped. I didn't have a problem with confrontation. And I said to the man, why are you following me? You're kind of creeping me out. The guy put his hands up as if to say, my bad. He then walked away and it was a huge relief. I had dealt with customers asking me out or trying to flirt with me a couple of times. It didn't happen very often, but here and there it did. None of them had been nearly as bad as this, though I kept working for several hours. By then I had forgotten about my experience earlier, but I soon remembered when I spotted the same man I couldn't believe it. At first, this was now about three hours after our first interaction. To me, it was still mind-blowing that he was still in the store. Maybe he had left, and then come back either way. It was strange, and it was now a bigger concern for me, because shortly after I had spotted him, I saw him look over at me and then look quickly away. The man was sort of far away, too. It looked like he was almost hiding from me. He stood mostly covered by a rack of clothing staring in my direction. I moved slightly and kept working, too. 
which the man moved slightly as well to keep looking at me, I stopped inside. This was really annoying now. I walked away, leaving what I was doing. I moved to a whole nother section of the store, far away from that one. There I didn't really have any work to do, but I just wanted to get that man off of me. I was now in the grocery area, and I was there for about a minute before spotting the man. Again, he was walking into the area, and he saw me for a split second, and then disappeared into a nearby aisle. At this point, I decided to take my break. I had one that I could take at any time, and I was planning to after I had finished the work that I was doing in the clothing department. But seeing as this creep was back and still following me around, I decided to just take my break. Now I radioed in on my walkie-talkie to let my supervisor know I would be taking my break. Then I headed towards the front end of the store. Our break room was through doors at the front, and I walked in there. When I got inside the break room, I thought back to the crazy situation. Did that man... Seriously, think he was being slick. I mean, I spotted him twice, and it was like he thought I couldn't see him. I just hoped that he would notice I was not there anymore, and then leave. I'm not going to lie, I took a little bit extra time on my break. I was pretty concerned to return back out and see the man again. If I did see him, I was going to have to tell a co-worker or our security team. I didn't want to have to do that. But I would, if it was necessary when I went back out, though I didn't notice the man anywhere. I went back to work in the clothing department, but was much more alert and constantly looking around. I didn't see the guy for the rest of my shift that night, which was about two more hours. I was really happy about this, but still I thought possibly he was still there, looking at me somewhere, and had just gotten better about hiding. At the end of the day, though, I don't think he was. I left work and went home, not seeing the guy at all. Soon, I forgot all about him. I worked several more times that week, mostly my usual shifts. One night, the very next week, I found myself working on a quiet evening. I was almost done, and it was past a busy amount of customers that we would usually get between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m., I was doing my usual work of organizing a section of the clothing department. That's when I got a call on my walkie. Somebody radioed asking for me and I radioed back, telling them to go ahead. I wasn't quite sure who had said it, but that wasn't uncommon. A big store, like Target, has so many employees. Plus there are always new people, a handful of my co-workers. I could instantly recognize their voices over the walkie-talkie, but many of them I could not. After telling them to go ahead, they asked me to go to Channel 3. This is how we would communicate without other employees hearing us. It was used for more descript details or directions on what we were supposed to do after turning to 3. I told him to go ahead again. That's when I was told that I was needed in receiving and to help with something quick. I told him that I was on my way and began walking over receiving was the back room of the store. Basically, I wouldn't work back there a lot, but I had helped with things there several times in the past. It took me a few minutes to walk all the way back there, and when I had made it, I exited the store into the back. Things were very quiet back there. I had expected to see someone there waiting for me. I turned my walkie to channel three again and said that I was in receiving. Nobody said anything, but I heard my voice echo under somebody else's walkie nearby. I then called out asking where they were, but I didn't get a response. I walked closer to the voice, which was near one of the doors leading to outside. I noticed it was open, and I could see outside into the night. That's when I saw the man again. He stepped out from behind a shelf back there. I couldn't believe he was here. That was you on the walkie, wasn't it? I said to him, the man just started walking towards me. I backed away as he got closer. I looked at how much taller he was than me. If he tried to grab me, it would be difficult to get away. He got closer and I turned around. But as soon as I did, he grabbed my arm. Then he started to pull me backwards. I started yelling, 
but back there it wasn't likely anybody would hear me. Suddenly I heard the doors leading back to the shopping area open. I then saw one of my co-workers, Amy, walking over. I yelled at her and she asked what was going on. The man let me go and then sprinted out the doors outside. I ran over to Amy and explained to her what had happened. Amy told me that she had heard the person asking me to go to Channel 3. She said that when she didn't recognize the voice and was just being nosy in general, she turned to Channel 3 as well. She was wondering what I was being asked to do when she heard I was supposed to go to receiving. She found it strange because she had just been there earlier in the night and wasn't aware of anything that would be done back there. She decided to see for herself, and I'm really glad that she did. We had to call the police and report the incident, but unfortunately not much. Could be done the man had bought a walkie-talkie and got on the same frequency as us, which was not hard to do at all. Many standard walkie-talkies were capable of it. I'm just glad I was alright. I worked at Target for a few months after that, and luckily never saw the man again, foreign Target employee. I worked there five years ago, pushing carts in the parking lot. This was one of my favorite jobs that I've had so far. To be honest, it was pretty enjoyable and easy work. However, I do have one really scary story to tell. This is something that still creeps me out. When I think about it, I worked at a super target, and it was in a busy area store, and the parking lot were very big, and they were close to other stores and restaurants that were close by. This made work challenging occasionally, because of how busy it would get. One time I was working a night shift, and it had been really busy in the day earlier, but by now things were very calm. It felt like the calm after the storm, because the carts were scattered throughout the parking lot. Not just in the corrals. This was typical on busy days when I had the time. Later I would go all around the parking lot and retrieve the carts that were not in the corrals. I would also bring all the ones that were in the corrals back to the store as well. Obviously, with how busy it had been earlier, I hadn't been able to keep up with the parking lot as perfectly as I would like, so it was probably about 9 p.m. or so. I went to the northeast corner of the parking lot. There was a car that was against the curb at the corner, the farthest away from the store. I walked over and got the card as soon as I was grabbing it. I noticed an SUV pulling into this area of the parking lot. There was an entrance exit right there as well. The SUV did not keep driving though, instead it stopped right in front of me. I found this kind of strange, but I just got the cart and started walking back to the store. But that's when I heard a voice call out, Hey! I looked back and saw a man getting out of the SUV. The vehicle was not parked in a parking space, but just parked there, partly covering two different spaces and the driving area. The guy said to me that maybe I could help him with something. I stopped with the cart and looked back to him. I asked him what he needed help with. The man waved me over and I started walking to him. He said that he didn't know if I knew much about cars or not, but he didn't and something weird was happening with his man was short, but looked sort of strong. I did know a little bit about cars, but not a whole lot. I was hoping that I would be able to help the man with this problem. Though, then the man asked me to get inside the back seat of his car and listen to the weird noise it made when he drove. The question really seemed to come out of left field. It took me by surprise, and it also seemed really sketchy. I changed my mind suddenly. Actually, I really don't know anything about cars. I said, then I turned around to get my cart and started walking back over to it. The man told me to wait, but I didn't. I kept walking, making my way back to the target. I heard footsteps of the man coming after me, though this was really strange. I sped up, the guy behind me seemed to speed up as well. At that point, I decided to just start sprinting. Felt like I was in danger, and I knew if I made it in the target, I would be safe. I ran all the way there, sprinting with the cart, and the man could not keep up and stopped chasing me. 
when I got back inside, I decided to work on the other end of the parking lot for a while. And that's exactly what I did. And I also tried to stay close to the building. As I collected cards from the other end, everything went fine. I looked out to the other side of the parking lot where the man in his car had been, and I didn't see him or the SUVS have left, which was good after working for a while. It was time for my final break of the day. It was a 15-minute break. I walk it back inside and into the break room. There I sat on my phone, scrolling through social media and Snapchatting with friends. At that time, I was the only person in the break room with it being laid there. It was an overlap of people at the end of their evening shifts or at the beginning of their overnight shifts. Nobody else was taking their break. This was fine with me about halfway through. I heard the door to the break room open and closed. There was a little hallway with a closet that led into the break room. I expected somebody to enter the room, but no one did. I didn't think anything of it. I continued sitting in my chair and looking at my phone. But several moments later, I had a strange feeling. It was like the feeling that I was being watched. I usually don't get this feeling, so when I did, I turned around. That's when I saw the guy who had chased after me earlier. He was standing in the entrance of the break room looking right at me. Then he started walking closer to me. I got up and once again sprinted away from the man. I ran out the other exit of the break room which led to an employee's only area where you punched in and there was a desk there as well. Nobody was back there at the time. There was also a door leading to outside and I ran out of it and back into the parking lot. I ran around to the other entrance door and quickly found one of the managers. I told them the whole story, but when they went into the break room, the man was gone. He must have exited after I had luckily, I didn't have much time left on the clock. I worked very carefully for the next 30 minutes or so. Then I punched out and went home. I never saw the man again. After this incident, I worked at Target for quite a while. Nothing like that ever happened again, which I'm glad to say I was driving for Domino's Pizza Delivery. It was a slow night, so I was actually spending a decent amount of time inside the shop, waiting for orders to come in for me to deliver. Just after 10 p.m., a man walked in and came up to the counter. He looked like he was in his early 30s, but was extremely sleep-deprived and maybe even drunk. My co-worker was at the counter helping him with the order, and I was standing in the back organizing the pizza boxes, but after seeing his appearance I listened in on their conversation. He seemed timid and uneasy about something as he made a simple request for a medium pizza, but then he added on that he'd like it to be delivered, and then handed my co-worker a slip of paper. Right after the order was sent through, the man walked out. The paper just had an address written on it. But it was kind of odd, because who wouldn't remember their own address? Also, it's not every day that you get a customer coming into the shop. So order for delivery to their house, anyway. Ten minutes later, I boxed up the pizza and got on the road. It didn't take long for me to notice a strange car behind me. It was the only other car on the road and they were constantly speeding up and slowing down like they were having trouble staying at the same speed once I saw them swerving. Two, the first thing I thought was that they were drunk and how the man at the shop looked drunk too. It seems stupid now, but at the time I really thought it was just a coincidence. When I got to the neighborhood, the car behind me pulled off to the side of the road and parked 30 seconds later, I pulled into the driveway of what looked like any other house and stepped up to the front porch. I knocked, then knocked again, and after a couple minutes of waiting, someone finally answered. It was a different man from the one I'd seen at the shop that ordered the pizza I had a Domino's delivery for Matthew. The man stared at me with very wide open eyes, and I noticed that he looked very similar to the way the other man looked, sleep deprived and drunk. It took him a few seconds to respond. Yeah, yeah, of course, thank you, he said quietly, reaching out for the pizza. I gave it to him and he looked at me like he was going to say something else, but he didn't. He just continued with his dull look. I then turned around and saw a guy in a hood 
jogging down the sidewalk, just two houses away, but he was looking right at us. I quickly went back to my car and the man at the door stepped out onto the porch like he was going to follow me. I got in and started backing out, but the guy in the hood went right behind my car to block me from leaving the other one, then started running toward me and, in the heat of the moment, I just stepped on the pedal to go in reverse. The guy behind the car jumped out of the way at the last second, and both of them started yelling and chasing my car onto the road in the street. Light, it became clear that the man in the hood was the guy who came into the pizza shop with them, still running at the front of my car, though I had to reverse dangerously fast down the street until I could safely make a three-point turn and get away. I called the cops, and within the hour... Both men were arrested for attempted robbery. Their plan was clearly made while drunk, because they thought that by ordering at the shop, we somehow wouldn't think it was them, because it was a delivery order, even though we had their name and address. It really made no sense, but according to the record, they had pulled multiple robberies before, and one of them resulted in the victim getting beaten up in a parking lot. For no reason, two drunk guys running at me with bad intentions could have escalated into something horrible, but I was glad to have gotten away without any harm, and thankfully they won't be able to do this to anyone else. I used to work for my best friend's parents' restaurant. I did deliveries for them and would sometimes help clean tables or whatever too. The job in itself was fine, but it felt very uncomfortable to have my friend's parents as my boss. I thought it wouldn't be too bad after a while, but it just never got better. They hated every time something wouldn't go exactly as planned, and they also scheduled. Me and my friend on opposite days, so it didn't even feel like we worked together, which was the whole point of me taking the job. This happened during my third and final month. Working there, it was a regular night to start getting a few quick deliveries. But I really slowed down toward the back half of the night. My friend's dad hated it when it was slow, because I'd be standing around waiting for orders, and he'd always be grumpy about it. Even though it wasn't my fault, around 8.30, which was an hour since my last delivery, and 30 minutes until the end of my shift, he picked up a phone call and I overheard him say that we could deliver afterwards. He made the food and handed me the bag to deliver, but when I searched the address up, it was 40 minutes away. Of course, I complained because by then my shift was over in 15 minutes, and this delivery would take nearly an hour and a half. But he didn't care. I could tell he was just upset about me, waiting around, which, again, was not my fault. But after a brief argument, I did. As he said, 40 minutes was pretty far away for our small town, so I had no idea where this address was. By the time I was two minutes away, it was just before 10 p.m., there were no houses nearby from what I could see until the last minute of the drive when it had me turned down a small street that led to a row of maybe six houses. They all look old and outdated, and they were the only houses I'd seen in the last five minutes of driving as slowly passed by each house and looked at their numbers until I found the right one. Then, I parked on the street right next to the driveway. I'm not gonna lie, this place gave me some spooky vibes. It was so far from everything, and the houses themselves were just old and creepy. I got out and brought the bag up to the doorstep, then rang the doorbell. Nobody came to the door, so I tried knocking. It was late, and I wanted to get this over with, so I was getting impatient. As I waited, I looked around the street, had no cars on it or in any of the driveways, and none of the actual lights were on inside any of the houses. I carried the bag back to my car and called the customer's cell. They didn't pick up, so I just sat in my car and tried to think of what to do next. They hadn't paid for the food yet, so I couldn't just leave it on their doorstep. Then I saw a light move around inside the house. I got out and saw the light move through the downstairs windows and over to the front door. Then it turned off. A second later, the door opened. 
There was a young man, early twenties, standing in the doorway, holding a large flashlight. In one hand and a grocery bag in the other, I walked up and asked if he had ordered the food. He nodded and apologized for taking so long to answer the door. I said it was all right and tried to hand him the bag, but he just held up both of his hands to show me they were full, then asked if I'd kindly put the food on the kitchen table for him. I wasn't sure if he was joking or not, at first because he easily could have just put the flashlight or grocery bag down for a second, but then I realized he was serious. I peeked around him and from the short entryway, I could tell that there was something off about this place. It was dusty all over and it looked empty once I saw that and thought about the flashlight being used instead of the regular house lights. I was almost sure that this place was a vacant house. The man was still looking at me and waiting for a response. Sorry, I'm actually in a rush. If you could just pay really quick, then I'll leave the bag right here on your porch. He didn't like that answer and he showed it with his face. He sat down the grocery bag and took one step out of the doorway and onto the porch. I backed up so as to not be too close to him. There was something in his eyes that told me he was about to do something, and I wasn't going to wait for whatever that was to happen. I dropped the bag and sprinted for my car driving away as the man watched me intently from the porch. I was shaking for most of the drive back, unsure of what could have just happened. Of course, though, when I told my friend's dad about what happened, all he seemed to care about was that I didn't make the man pay for that reason. I just quit right there on the spot. I knew my friend would be upset, but I'd had enough of his parents being dissed to me for doing nothing wrong. After that, that was pretty heated and was thinking more about that than I was about the man who lured me to a vacant house and likely tried to rob me or even worse, being so distracted. I never called the police, not until it was too late anyway. Thankfully, I wasn't dumb enough to go inside the house, though, because if I had, I probably never would have returned from that delivery. Music back in high school. I signed up for DoorDash just to see if it was as good as they advertised it, initially, though it took me a whole month to finally get myself to take on my first delivery. But from then on, I did a couple deliveries a day and was really happy with the results. A couple months after that, I quit my grocery job and started dashing every day after school. And even on most weekends on this night, I was working extra late. Because it was a holiday weekend, I was driving from 8 p.m. until 2 a.m., pretty much just going back and forth from the 24-7 McDonald's, a little past 2 I picked up another McDonald's order and went en route to the customer. It was set to be delivered at some sort of a warehouse, and in the notes it said to go in through the side doors and drop it off at the front desk. When I got there, I pulled into this huge parking lot. It was mostly empty, only having a few semi-trucks in it. The building was definitely an old warehouse, though, being just a large rectangle with a few windows and a single door at the front. I checked one more time to make sure I had it right, to deliver it through the side door, then pulled around to the side. In part, the side door was one of those really heavy metal doors with a small glass window. I looked through that tiny window and didn't see anything but a small and dark entrance room. But the glare from my car's headlights made the window reflective and hard to see through. I swung it open and was immediately taken back. It was just as dark as it seemed through the window, and it only had a tiny wall light in the corner that was more of a dim safety light. There was no front desk, so I walked around the corner and stood at the end of a long, unlit corridor. I knew that most places that have night shift workers don't keep on the unnecessary lights, but this seemed excessive. I couldn't even see the end of the hallway, so if I were to walk down there I would be walking into complete darkness. Took my phone out and checked now for a third time to see if I'd gone to the wrong place or through the wrong door. Everything seemed right, but there wasn't any way I was going to walk through that hallway. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized how quiet the whole building was. No, 
machinery moving or people talking. Not a sound at all, I decided to call the customer. I clicked on their name and had to dial the number. And just a moment later, I heard a phone ring, echo from the other end of the hallway. After another few seconds, it rang again. But it was closer and louder. This time, I stared into this empty corridor and could barely make out the faint glow of someone's phone. Hey, I got an order here from DoorDash. I'm gonna leave it right here for you, I said, setting the bag down in front of me. The figure of a large man started to come out of the dark corridor, but they didn't say anything. I waited another second, but as they got closer it just really seemed unnerving, the way they were walking so fast and not speaking. I had this feeling like someone was gonna jump out behind me or something, and overall was a little freaked out. I turned around and walked quickly out of the door and back to my car. A few moments later I saw some movement from behind the small glass window on the door, just before I pulled away. That whole thing gave me chills, and had me call it a night and go straight home. In the end, I chose to believe it was just a weird situation all around, but nothing really happened, so I blew it off a couple days would go by. And on Monday evening, while I was driving again, I got a strange call. It was from the police department. What happened next was more complicated than it had to be. But basically, they questioned me about why I was at that specific warehouse at 2.30 a.m. on Saturday morning. Apparently, they had security footage of my car pulling up after explaining I was just a DoorDash driver, and I approved it with the delivery receipt. They told me what was going on. They said that the workers came back from their holiday weekend, where the warehouse was not in operation, and found a DoorDash delivery sitting in the middle of the hallway. Whoever was there had broken in and ordered with a fake account, which is all scary in its own right. But the creepiest part is that they didn't even take the bag of food. It's pretty obvious that they were looking for something else. I don't know what they wanted from me, but I can only assume that if I had stayed and waited for the man. Something terrible would have happened. This happened last summer. I'm a 32-year-old male, and I live alone in an apartment outside of the city. At the time, I just moved in and had thrown away a lot of old stuff that I had from my other place. So I was occasionally scrolling through Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace, looking for a few furnishings. The two things I needed the most were a coffee table and a TV stand, but I wasn't in too much of a rush, so I didn't mind searching for a couple weeks if I had to. I remember it being a Monday night and I had just gotten home from work. I was scrolling through some posts on Craigslist at the dinner table and came by a coffee table that I liked. Cheap, not too old, and in good condition I sent an email and continued scrolling. But not even 20 seconds later I got an email reply. Back the man, Cole, said he could sell it to me, but it had to be tonight because he was moving out and planned to throw it away in the morning having nothing else to do that night I responded sure just let me know where to pick it up from he sent over an address and I did a quick google search of it the house was 25 minutes away in a neighborhood I'd never been to before I told him to give me an hour and I'd be there although I was tired and it was pretty late I didn't mind doing a quick pickup I was also just happy to finally get a coffee table for my living room. I finished eating my meal at the table, then got in my car and started driving there. There was a light drizzle outside, so I was hoping the table wasn't too heavy and we could quickly get it in my car without getting water damage. The drive there felt long going down some windy roads until ending up in a small poorly lit neighborhood by poorly lit. I mean that there were very few street lights all being dim and most of the houses had their lights off. It was late so I didn't expect everyone to be up at this time but still it was a bit creepy. When I found the house it was a small one-story place. One of the few houses that had its lights on. As I turned into the driveway I saw a man standing in the corner of the garage seemingly searching for something. When I put the car in park the man looked over at me, then quickly ran. 
Inside, I waited for a minute, thinking he was going to come back out, but he didn't. I exited my car and walked into the garage, knocking on the door. Then I knocked again, but nobody was answering. I wasn't sure if I should go to the front door or what. But it was giving me a weird feeling, and I was starting to think of just leaving, when the door suddenly opened. It was a different man than I'd seen in the garage, but he introduced himself as Cole. He invited me in to check out the coffee table. I followed him into the living room. The table looked as it did in the pictures and wasn't broken or anything, so I was good to buy it. Cole was making small talk with me, telling me about his new place he just bought. But every time I tried to interrupt and say I'd like to buy the table, he would keep talking. It started to get uncomfortable. Standing there listening to him talk over me for five whole minutes, it felt like more of a distraction, like he was keeping me there. I finally just cut him off and said I was in a hurry and needed to get home. Soon he stopped talking and said I could have it for free. I suspiciously said okay, then asked if he could help me haul it into my car, and we both grabbed it and started walking it through the house. It wasn't super heavy, but it definitely was a two-person lift. We got it into the garage and set it down for a rest. But right away, I heard someone running up behind me. They came from the side of the house, running up to me, wearing a mask and hoodie. I froze up, both scared and confused. The man wasn't very aggressive, and Cole just stood there with a blank face. Music. The man asked for my wallet and phone, holding up a knife at me. Music. I put my hands up, but I really didn't feel threatened enough to comply. He asked again, louder this time. I took my chances and sprinted for my car. The man lunged at me, but I kept running, getting in and locking the door before they could do anything. I backed out and drove away, and that's when I noticed a cut on my arm that went through my shirt. The man must have slashed me, but in the moment, I didn't even notice. I pulled over a few roads down and called the police, providing them with an address and description of the two men. To sum it all up, the cops questioned Cole, which was actually his name, and after a brief interrogation, he admitted the masked man was his buddy, and they were just trying to rob me with no intention of selling anything. They were both young, and it was their first time trying something like this, so I guess they were nervous, and that's why it felt so strange. Lucky for me, the cut on my arm wasn't deep at all. Not even needing stitches when it came down to it. They were given a few charges, but nothing too serious. I'm glad I chose to run, though, because I worry that if I had let them take advantage and rob me, then they would have had the confidence to continue doing it. After this, though, I don't think they'll be trying that again. I know I'll be criticized for this, but I used to be a frequent user of Craigslist. In my defense, I always met in public places and made sure to talk on the phone and everything before going out and meeting them. For me, it was the easiest place to sell random items around the house or to buy things that would otherwise run my account into the negatives for years. I had nothing happen at all. I'd met tons of random people and bought or sold more things than I can count. But after this, everything changed. I was searching around for a bicycle and came across a nice one for cheap. Maybe not that nice, but it just looked like a normal bike and was said to still work, which was fine for me. I emailed the person about my interest, and they replied within the hour, saying it was still available for the listed price. We had a quick phone call discussing where and when to meet up. Eventually, deciding on a gas station that was halfway between. Both of us, they agreed on time was 6:30. On the day of I drove out and got to the gas station 15 minutes early, he said he would be driving a blue Chevy truck. So I stayed on the lookout. 30 minutes went by and the man still hadn't shown the sun was setting, and I really didn't want to do the deal in the dark. So I texted him asking if he was close. A minute later, I got a call. Sorry, I'm on my way right now. Be there in a few minutes. Then he hung up abruptly without letting me say anything. He spoke in a rush, which made it hard to tell if I should be worried about the strange nature of the call or if he was just trying to get here quickly. 
because he knew he was late. I sat in my car waiting another 15 minutes for him to finally show up. The truck he drove was really old and beat up, not exactly making me feel good. About buying something from him, I got out and greeted him. He was an average height man wearing baggy clothes looking around 20 to 30 years old and for lack of a better word, looked dirty. He had gross hair and his clothes looked like they'd never been washed. He walked around to his truck bed and opened it, pulling out the bike. Surprisingly, it was in perfect condition. It didn't look like anything fancy, but it was definitely well taken care of. Unlike everything else with this man, I did a quick walk around and wrote it for a minute, and it was all good, but then I put everything together in my head and instantly lost my excitement. This bike was almost definitely stolen after seeing the man in his truck. There was just no way this could be his bike for the bike being at least five to six years old. There wasn't a single scratch or speck of dirt on it. Once the thought came into my head, I knew I wouldn't feel comfortable buying it, unless I was sure it wasn't stolen. I tried to be discreet about it and asked, so how long have you had it a few years? He responded that gave me nothing, so I asked why he wanted to sell it. Pretty common question, I think, but his response threw me off. What's it matter? It works, right? He looked at me with an impatient and rude face. Ironic, how he was the impatient one after making me wait for him to show up. I said I no longer wanted it, and told him to have a nice night, then went to open my car door. The man was quick to force my door shut before I could fully open it. Nah, you're buying it. I didn't come out here for nothing. I knew this was a bad situation, but I saw a few cars and people right by us at the gas station, so I wasn't too worried. I expressed my concerns about where he got the bike from and that I wasn't going to buy what wasn't his. He hesitated, then shoved me against my car and yelled at me to give him the money. He hit me again, and I was forced to pull out my wallet and give him all my cash. He jumped back in his truck and drove off, almost causing an accident on the way out of the gas station. I looked around at the three or four people who were just standing there watching. Not a single one of them helped me or even stayed to be a witness. Cops never found him, so I was out 100 bucks. Not to be that person, but I also kind of lost faith in humanity. No one cared to help me, but they all cared to watch me get beat up and robbed in public. I posted an old laptop for sale on Craigslist a few months back. It worked just fine, but I had to buy a better one for work, and I really had no reason to have two. I wasn't looking for much, I think I listed it for $80, which was a really good deal after a few days passed with no responses. I mostly forgot about it, until I checked my emails again a week later and saw I'd gotten a message. They simply said they wanted to look at it and asked if it was still available. I replied, and later that day they got back to me. They said they could swing by tomorrow, and we agreed on 5 o'clock. Later that night I realized I never got his name the email address he was sending from was some personal email that looked more like a gamer tag, so it wasn't that helpful. I didn't think too much of it, assuming he just didn't realize what address he was using on the following day. I reached out and sent him my address a few hours before five. It was my day off, so I was going to be home all day, around 4.30. I checked my emails again, but the guy still hadn't responded to my last message. Maybe he didn't feel like it needed to be responded to. I went over and opened the blinds on the window so I could see when he pulled up, then sat on my couch and turned on the TV. I was sitting there for almost an hour watching TV and glancing out the window every few minutes, but they never showed. Considering our last contact was from yesterday, I figured he had second thoughts and was standing me up. In all honesty, I didn't think that much about it. I just continued watching TV and tried to enjoy the rest of my night, as I normally would by 8 o'clock. I was dozing off on the couch, in and out of sleep, when I woke up to a sound at my back door. 
after gaining full consciousness, I got up and looked over, seeing nothing out there. I flipped the porch light on just to be sure, but the backyard was empty. The sound I heard was hard to identify because I wasn't even awake, but I thought it was the sound of someone trying to open the door. I went around and made sure all the doors were locked, then checked the windows to see what I could see, until a knock came at the front door. I quietly walked up and looked out the peephole. There was a guy late thirties, maybe on my porch. He was pacing back and forth and talking under his breath. Then he stopped and came back up to the door and knocked again. Who is it? I asked, keeping the door closed. And still looking out the peephole, he stared at the door, then said he was trying to talk to the homeowner. The way he said it with a stutter and slurred words made it obvious he was on something or wasn't. Right in the head, I chose not to respond. And once the guy realized this, he called out again, saying he really needed to talk to me. He was pacing again, acting really unsettling while keeping an eye on him. I took my phone out of my pocket and dialed 911. He knocked again while I was on the phone, but then he ran off the porch toward the garage. I immediately went to get my newer laptop and pulled up the live feed for my security camera that I had just above the garage. On the footage, his car was parked all the way up my driveway, probably just a few inches from touching my garage door, and the guy was using a crowbar to try and wedge the garage open. He looked insane, but it scared the out of me. After some failed attempts, the guy went in his car and was shifting around, trying to find something in his glove box before getting out and hitting my garage with his crowbar, then driving away despite providing the security footage, showing the man and his car to the police. The guy remains unidentified. It's also unclear if it was related to the Craigslist posting, but I'm convinced it was. I don't know what that guy wanted or what he would have done. Had he gotten inside, I was on a road trip, heading back from a job interview I had across the States. I stayed for an extra couple days to make it a mini vacation, which was why I drove. Instead of taking a plane anyway, it was pouring outside, which would usually make for a relaxing drive, but it was the middle of the night, so it made visibility difficult. Most of the drive consisted of going through dense forest. On long one-lane roads, the drive was supposed to be around 10 hours, and obviously with rain I expected a slight delay. It was just past 1 a.m. when I checked my phone and saw it was 62 miles until the next turn. For some reason though, Apple Maps was taking me on a different route from the way I'd taken before. I didn't see it as a problem at all and continued for a while, maybe 30 minutes, before I glanced over at my phone again. It still said I was 62 miles away from the next turn. I looked closer and my car wasn't even moving on the map. I tried clicking on it and restarting the app, but it was frozen on that screen to make things worse. All it said was, turn right in 62 miles with no road or street name. Without that, I had no idea where I was going or when to turn, other than a tiny memory of a street name. It had shown me before it was one of those where if I saw the street sign, then I'd recognize and remember it, but I couldn't fully remember it on my own. Despite the inconvenience, I continued driving for a while in hopes that it was just an internet connection thing, and once I was out of the dense forest, it would fix itself an hour or so of driving. Later, I was still in the forest and the rain was still pouring down, but I saw an intersection coming up on the connecting street. There was a truck parked on the side, and I figured they were probably having the same problem I was having. I slowed and looked at the street sign, and to my surprise, I thought I actually recognized it. It could have just been some coincidence or a false memory due to my lack of sleep, but I ended up turning and taking my chances. At first, I was fairly confident in my choice, thinking I might have actually made the right call. But after an hour of driving, I was still in the forest. I knew for sure that I didn't spend even nearly this much time driving through the forest on the way there, so something was wrong. 
I checked my phone and still had no luck. But up ahead, I saw a faint glow of a billboard sign. A motel right there in the middle of this isolated forest. It seemed like an odd choice for a motel, but I pulled into the parking lot so I could safely figure out my situation. The whole lot was empty, not a single car. A minute later, though, that same truck I'd seen back at the intersection pulled in and parked a few spots down. I couldn't see much through the rain, so I just ignored them and continued with trying to get my phone to work. I want to say I probably sat there for 15 minutes before giving up, just before deciding to go into the motel to either ask for help or get a room. A knock on my window startled me. Hey, can you help me? He yelled through the rain. I rolled the window down a crack, letting rain splash all over me as I asked what he wanted. He said he needed some directions. He told me a very specific address, as if I were to know where it was. Sorry, man, I'm just as lost as you are. He frowned, then smiled and said to have a nice night walking back through the rain to his truck. After a minute, I got out and ran into the motel. The front room was dark and empty. Nobody was at the desk. I leaned over the counter to see if someone was in the back. But then the front door opened behind me. I turned and saw that man from the truck outside. He was soaked with water. Dripping from his long hair and beard, the look on his face was cold and sinister, and he had one hand suspiciously shoved in his pocket. In that instant, I quickly tried walking past him. He stayed firmly my way, but for whatever reason, he didn't stop me from squeezing past him and out the door as I quickly walked to my car. I heard the man exit the building behind me and his footsteps catching up. I got in and turned on my car, just as the man came up to my window, and through the rain I heard the sound of my door latch click. Thank God my car auto-locks because as soon as I heard that and looked up at him, he stared at me with disturbingly rage-filled eyes and began forcefully trying to open the door he was pulling so hard the entire car was rocking back and forth. I pulled out and drove off so fast I almost ran him over. I got back to the intersection and sped down the way I was going. Before, thankfully, I made it to a city after 20 miles and was able to get help. It turned out the motel I was at had closed down a couple months back and for some reason the sign still worked, which nobody could explain to me. I don't know what that man's intentions were and whether or not he had planned that whole thing out. But one thing I am sure of is that I got very lucky with my escape from that motel when I was 21. I went on a vacation to Washington. It was somewhere I'd been dreaming of going since I was a kid. My plans were to hang out around Seattle and stay in the city for the most part. But I figured it was only right to go camping in the massive forest and woods that Washington had to offer. I only wanted to camp for a night and then head back to the city I'd been camping a few times before, but never on my own. So this was a first. I rented out some camping gear from a local shop and found a small trail with camping grounds. I drove down there and got going as soon as the sun was up. To the camping grounds was very easy and took me less than three hours. It was basically just a flat plot of land that had some clear signs of previous campers being there, like old equipment, rusty, cooking pots and some trash. I set up my tent off to the side next to a tree where the area was clear. As far as I knew, there weren't any special sights to see nearby, so I was just there to chill and be at peace. At sunset, I got a fire going and brought out my Ziploc bag that I had prepared full with s'mores ingredients. I made an unhealthy amount, and when I was done, I just sat next to the campfire and spent some time thinking that was until I was interrupted. A man came up behind me from seemingly nowhere and sat at the other end of my campfire. Oh, hey, you camping around here too? I asked, trying to make the strange encounter less awkward. He looked at me, but he didn't respond my question. I looked around behind me and to the sides to see if anyone else was here, but it was just us. A moment went by before he stood up and walked away. I don't recall if I was more nervous, 
creeped out or confused. But nonetheless, I stayed there and kept my eyes open for the next hour. Eventually, I put my fire out and went inside my tent, staying up for another hour before falling asleep. I woke up in the middle of the night to a strange sound, the crackle of a campfire. I opened my eyes and saw the orange light flickering in front of my tent. My heartbeat grew faster and louder. As I unzipped the tent, my campfire had been rekindled, and four men sat around it, all looking directly at me. One of them was the same man who'd come by previously. I slowly stepped out of the tent and looked at each of them in horror. Before I could say anything, one of them spoke something in a foreign language, and then two of them got up and grabbed me, patting me down and taking my phone in wallets. These guys were way bigger than me, and there was no point in resisting after a good search. They then dragged me away from the campsite. We walked for a good twenty minutes out into the woods, and I was holding back tears, pretty sure this was the end. But then they shoved me on the ground, hit me over the head, and ran away. I think they were trying to knock me out, or at least dazed me enough to not follow them. But I felt like it was pretty obvious that given the circumstances I wasn't going to go strolling back toward them. I got up and immediately started jogging in the direction that I thought would take me closer to the interstate that ran between the forest once all the adrenaline was out. Though my head was killing me and it was hard to think straight. Not to mention it was pitch black and I was stumbling over fallen logs in tree roots and had no way of knowing if I was walking straight or not. Then I'd say about 30 minutes into walking. I passed out. It was likely from a mix of everything. But when I regained consciousness, I realized that I had even less of an idea of which direction to go in. I walked, and what I prayed was the right direction, knowing that there was a chance that I could just get even more lost after an hour of seeing nothing but large trees and dark woods. I spotted a light in the distance. It was a flashlight moving around like someone was carrying it. As I approached, I screamed for help only to see the figure of a man turn toward me and shine the light in my direction, followed by three more figures appearing behind him. Without hesitating, I sprinted away, but they didn't seem to follow me from that encounter. Although scaring the out of me again, I saw the way they were walking and was able to keep myself going in that direction. Two more hours of walking, and at the break of dawn, I reached the interstate. After another half hour, I finally waved down a car and was safe from there after getting back to the city and contacting police. I got my car back and gave the officers the best description of the events that I could give. I still had to pay for the lost rental items, but that was far from the worst of it. Lucky for me, the men who robbed and attacked me didn't seem to be in the killing business. But leaving me out in a vast force like that in the middle of the night was giving me slim chances at best, as odd as it sounds, if I hadn't seen them for a second time. Although as horrifying as it was, it's likely the only reason I'm still here today. I lived on my own for the first time in my life when I turned 25, and Amy want to explore doing other things by myself too. And one thing I'd always wanted to do was go for a long hike. It might sound a little weird, but it was just something that I thought sounded like an accomplishment to do. Solo, I had no experience in any outdoorsy activities. So this was my first big trail online. It said it was eight hours, so I packed as much water and food as I could. And on Monday morning, I set out on the hike. The first thing I noticed when I started walking was how thin the trail was. I didn't know if this was normal or not but it was barely wide enough to walk on without stepping on the borders of the trail while being thin. It was still very defined, and I knew I'd be back well before dark, so I wasn't worried about it. Although I didn't do much hiking, I was still in decent shape, so walking long distances wasn't an issue. Most of the way up the trail, I was feeling great and having no problem. But as I kept going, it did start to wear me down a bit. checked my watch constantly and 
Once I was six hours in and still hadn't reached the end, I was starting to worry. Supposedly, the end of the trail was a small overlook of the valley, so there was no way I could just walk past it or miss it somehow. But according to the website I'd seen earlier, I was two hours behind. Then I started to think, maybe it meant the trail was eight hours to complete one way, and was not including the walk back, but I just knew that I had to turn back at this point. If I wanted to be out of the forest before dark, I turned around and began walking back the way I came. As I walked back, I noticed a few things that I hadn't noticed on the way up. Specifically, there was a line of a prince that went perpendicular to the path going right across from one end of the forest to the other, and just kept going as far as I could see. I thought, maybe I didn't see it before because of the different point of view. But I was already a bit worried, and this wasn't helping my case. Then three hours into the hike back, and nearly nine hours total being in the forest, the trail I was walking on started to widen. One thing I knew for sure was that the trail was thin the entire time up. So when I saw this, my stomach tightened. I didn't know how, but I had gotten onto the wrong trail, maybe taking a side path. Accidentally, I stood there like a terrified child for a few minutes, unsure of my next move. The sun was already setting, and if I had taken the wrong turn in the daytime, how would I make sure to follow my way back and not make the same mistake in the dark? I knew my choices were limited, so I had to turn back again and hope for the best. I started walking, but not long into it. I saw footprints again, not the same ones from before, and I knew these weren't there just ten minutes ago. I looked out into the forest in the direction they were going, but it was now too dark to see much. Soon I couldn't see anything. The moonlight provided a dim overcast, but I hadn't packed the flashlight. It was the middle of April too, so the nights would get pretty cold where I lived. As I walked, the only sound was my footsteps on the gravel and the soft noises the forest made. That was until I heard something ahead, someone else walking on the gravel. I stopped and stared ahead into the dark, but after a few steps, the sound went away. I carefully moved forward until I saw the footprints in the gravel. Going straight across the trail, turned my phone light on and pointed it into the forest. It was still too dim, but I knew someone was out there. Hello, I called out. There was nothing but silence. I held my phone light up still, and after a moment I saw a very slight fog from someone's cold breath rise from behind a nearby tree. They were maybe ten feet away from me into the forest, but seeing as they were hiding made me scared as to what they were up to and why exactly they didn't want to be seen. I quickly walked further down the trail, and after thirty minutes I found where I had accidentally turned off. Several hours later I made it out and got to my car. I hated myself for weeks after that, for having gotten myself into such a bad situation, but it only got worse. I think it was exactly three weeks since my hike, when I saw in the news that two bodies were found in the forest. I had hiked in. They didn't give exact locations, but it was in the area near the trail I had taken. I don't think they found who had done it, but I'm almost positive that at one point I was standing just ten feet away from them, close enough to see their cold breath in the dark. Last year was my senior year of high school. My friend group was always full of dumb ideas. All it took was a boring weekend night for us to go out and find anything to entertain us. That's exactly what happened this night. It was me and my two other friends hanging out and just trying to think of something to do. One of them, Mikey, had been talking of this abandoned place nearby for the past few weeks. We pushed it off for a while, but now with nothing to do, it didn't sound all that bad of an idea to go exploring. He said it was a house on the edge of town where all the farmland was, but aside from the location that was about all he knew me and the other friends, shrugged and said, why not? 
and within 15 minutes we were on the road. We drove for a half hour until we reached the point where Mikey said to turn off onto an unpaved road, and a few minutes later we exited the tree line and were right in front of the house. It was a very large house with a huge plot of abandoned farmland. Around it, we got out of the car and each took a flashlight, then approached the front door. I turned the knob and it was unlocked, but when I tried shoving it open, it was blocked by something heavy on the other side. We went around to the back and tried the back door, but that door was locked. We resorted to crawling through a busted window on the side of the house. As soon as we were in a strong, awful smell took over. It was like a mixture of mold and rotting animal carcass. I mean, this was the worst smell I'd ever experienced by a long shot. My friends didn't seem as phased as I was, so we kept moving in right away. We noticed footprints all... Throughout the dusty hallway floors, we thought nothing of it, because we figured this place had basically been a tourist attraction for stupid teenagers like us. The whole place was unnervingly empty, though there wasn't any old furniture or garbage on the floor as we walked through the first few rooms. We reached the hallway that led to the front door, and against the front door was an old couch with a bunch of boxes on top of it. Whoever had done that had taken what looked like everything from inside the house just to block the front door from opening. We continued up the stairs to see if the upstairs rooms were empty too. At the top of the steps I shined my flashlight down the hallway. There were three doors, we opened the first two, and they were both empty bedrooms. Then I opened the third, and not surprisingly it was empty too, but this room was much smaller than the others. The reason this confused all of us was because there were no more rooms next to it. So based on the layout of the house, it was easy to assume that this room was supposed to be double the size of the others. Since there were no more doors with nothing left to see, we started back down the stairs. But as we got halfway down, we all heard the same thing. Sounded like a ball hitting the floor, rolling, then quickly and intentionally being stopped. It came from upstairs where we just, or cautiously we checked each of the rooms again and found nothing. All of us hearing the exact same thing made it extra odd because we all knew it happened but there was nothing upstairs. After that, we were all getting uncomfortable, and we quickly left the house through the same window. We came in from, we walked to the front where the car was, and got in just before I pulled out, though I noticed two windows upstairs on the left side of the house, and I specifically remembered that the small room we were confused by only had one window. I pointed this out to my friends, and we all sat there staring at the second floor windows and trying to figure out what was going on. Then there was a sudden flicker of a shadow moving across the blinds, followed by a dim light glowing from behind the window. In the light, the figure of a man could be seen looking out the window at us, put the car in drive, did a U-turn, and sped down the dirt road, getting out of there as fast as possible. After some discussion, Mikey convinced us to call the police, but the police found nothing in the house. Whoever was there had moved out and probably took everything with them, when I think back on it. Now I'm just happy that we didn't try too hard to search for any more rooms. When we were up there, if we did, I wouldn't doubt it if whoever was hiding in there was prepared to take drastic measures not to be found. This happened almost four years ago now on a road trip I was taking across the country. I'm a frequent traveler and adventurer going on long road trips and stopping at great hiking and camping locations all around the nation. At the time, I had been on the road for well over a month and was taking a short break at a small town in Nevada. While at the bar talking with the locals, they asked me if I was here to see the mines. I didn't know exactly what they meant and asked for more details, and they all talked about how there were hundreds of abandoned mines and mining towns all over the state. When I went back to my camper that night, I looked it up and found all these interesting mines. Not far from where I was, I had planned to just pass through Nevada as a whole. 
but after seeing this, I couldn't help myself. The next day, I set out for one of the abandoned mining towns. The actual hiking portion only took an hour and a half, but... It was mostly uphill when I arrived. The town was on a flat portion of the large hill. There were 20 to 30 small wooden buildings, and in the center of the town was a railroad leading into the hill where the mine entrance was. I walked along this railroad looking at the identical rows of wooden structures. I was more interested in the actual mine than I was in the ghost town, but it was still cool to see. I checked out one of the structures, but it was full of dirt and rubble, and I was sure that all the others would probably be the same at the entrance to the mine. I took out my flashlight, and when I pointed it through, the tunnel was so long that I couldn't even see the end. I started walking, and the further inside I got, the more quiet everything was, until eventually it was just the sound of my footsteps echoing through the mine. After a couple minutes, I reached the end of the railroad tracks and was met by a sign that said the area beyond was closed. Of course, I walked past it. The tunnel very quickly became shallower and less well-rounded. There was then a turn that started going down at a slope, and at one section of it, the floor had caved in. Someone before me had set up some makeshift walkway to get across the opening, but it seemed incredibly dangerous and unstable. I pointed the flashlight down and the drop was enough to have me permanently trapped. If I were to fall, I decided to turn back and went down one of the other side passages that had passed up previously and found myself at a ladder going down a steep tunnel. Again, I shined my flashlight and saw that the bottom of the ladder wasn't even visible. I started my descent, but not long into it. I heard something from below. It was a loud thud echoing through the mine. The echo made it hard to know how close or far it was. I pointed my flashlight down, and while I didn't see the cause of the sound, I did see the bottom. I climbed down and found myself at the base of another passageway, and a few feet in I found what caused the thud. There was a large rock sitting in the middle of the tunnel which I thought could have fallen from the ceiling, but it wasn't hard to tell that it was an entirely different kind of rock, which begged the question, how did it fall and create a thud? I got my answer when I pointed the flashlight further down the tunnel. Two almost unidentifiable people stood in the middle of the passage, about ten feet down, one man and one woman. I knew from one look that they were not explorers. The way they looked at me was like they didn't even know I was a person. I started backing up, being cautious with my movements to not make them feel threatened in any way. When I got to the ladder, I dreaded putting the flashlight in my pocket and started climbing up part of the way up. I swear I heard someone grab onto the rungs below me and begin climbing up quickly. I looked down and saw nothing but darkness. I screamed and began climbing up as fast as I could. I sprinted out of the mine and away from the ghost town during the hike back. I collected my thoughts, thinking maybe what I heard was their footsteps, and in the moment I just mistaken it for them climbing up after me. But it was still terrifying. I drove down to a police station in the area and reported what had happened, but as far as I know the police didn't do any sort of search or anything. Despite me telling them that they looked malnourished and deeply insane, even if they didn't know it themselves, they seriously needed help. I did some digging online since then, and thought of some interesting theories as to why they may have been there to begin. With there were several cases from around the area of couples that went missing within the past ten years, mostly due to committing horrible crimes and likely running away from the police. It just makes me think how if that were to be true, and these were two people who committed terrible crimes, then I was very lucky to have escaped after seeing them. Um, me and my best friend Glenn grew up in a small town far from many big cities. The population was less than a thousand, so yeah, it was very local, and everyone knew everyone growing up. 
Rumors would spread about various creepy things that would go on in the town, almost likely fake. But one of the words that would spread was of this small community a few miles out in the surrounding woods that was abandoned decades ago by the time Glenn and I were in high school. We found out from multiple people that the community was actually real, and there was a whole history to it. After finding that out, it was impossible for us to resist the urge to go out there and see what all the talk was about. We tried planning the whole trip out, but in the end we just packed a backpack with some water and flashlights, then headed into the woods. We got some basic directions to this poorly made trail that supposedly led there, and we followed it down for about three miles, but then it ended. There were no other trails or anything. It was just a dead end. My immediate thought was that we'd been set up by some elaborate prank, but Glenn wasn't convinced he somehow got me to follow him for another half mile through the woods. Not following any trailer directions by then, we'd already been out longer than expected, and the sun wasn't at its highest. I was nervous about getting lost without the sunlight or a clear path to follow. But just before we turned back, Glenn spotted a shape in the distance. It was too far to see exactly what, but it was rigid, indefinitely man-made. As we got closer, the shape revealed itself to be a worn and broken down cabin. The roof had caved in, and it looked like people had been around here recently, but when we walked around to the other side of the cabin, there was a large field where all the trees had been cut down. In the field stood six cabins of varying sizes, along with a few other structures that I couldn't really identify. Both of us were shocked to actually have found this place, and in person it was way creepier than we ever could have imagined. The houses were all falling apart in one way or another. We walked over to one of the cabins close to us and went inside. It was trashed, but it looked like most of the furniture, like wooden chairs and tables, were still intact, and sitting in the same place they had been decades ago. The sunset was casting long shadows on everything, which really just gave it all an eerie feeling. I went into what I think was supposed to be the bedroom, but as I looked around, I heard someone walking outside the cabin. I turned around to give Glenn a nervous look, but he wasn't there, staying quiet. I looked through a crack in the wall to see if the person outside was Glenn, but as the footsteps came closer, I caught sight of them. It was a tall old man, I'd say, mid-fifties, half-naked, and the clothes he did have on were torn and disgusting. He walked past the cabin, and I turned back and started looking through the rooms for Glenn. But he must have left. At some point, I exited through an empty window frame and stayed behind the cabin as I tried to scan the whole field for any sign of Glenn. But I saw no signs of him. I assumed he was exploring one of the other houses, but I had no idea if he was even aware of this man that had just entered the abandoned community. frantic state of moving around the outside of the cabin and searching for Glenn, I realized I'd lost sight of the man. I was struggling to keep myself calm, and the whole woods was getting darker by the minute. Then, all of a sudden, there was a horrifying scream from the other side of the abandoned town. I peered around the cabin and saw Glenn running through the open field. Once he saw me, we both ran into the woods back toward home. Thankfully, we found the trail before the sun fully set, because once the sun went down, we could only see a few feet ahead. When we finally got back, I asked Glenn what happened. He said he was exploring one of the houses. And as he did, he started to realize that it didn't look as abandoned as the others, and someone was likely living there when he turned to leave. The same man I'd seen was standing on the other side of the cabin holding a knife. He described his eyes as having a look of hunger, and without hesitation the man charged at him. Glenn screamed and ran, and I guess the man didn't chase very far. We don't know what that man would have done to us, but it was stupid to have even gone to that abandoned town in the first place, and it almost cost us our lives to figure that out. I never intended to cause an uprising before I get into the details. I need you to understand three things. 
McDonald's, French fries are commonly derived from the rust of Burbank potato. McDonald's French fries are delivered to the store, partially cooked, and flash frozen from the factory. I am not crazy. It was an ordinary Thursday lunch shift. I'd always worked the cash register in dining room, restocking everything from the ketchup dispensers to the ice machine. But this was my first time working the fryer. Mr. Sloan, our shift manager, had painstakingly walked me through the process. Grab a 10 pounds bag of fries from the freezer dump, the contents into the fry baskets, and then lower the baskets into a scalding bed of oil for three minutes. Easy enough, right? Even a trained chimp could do it. However, sometimes easy enough, quickly turns into diabolically difficult. I just lowered the twin baskets of fries into the oil, and immediately I could hear a high-pitched whine, the type of whine you hear when the air is being released slowly from the pinched mouth of a balloon. My ears began to experience a stabbing ache, like twin pot. My ears began to experience a stabbing ache, like twin ice picks being repeatedly jabbed on my ear. Canals I checked around the kitchen, but nobody else appeared to be hearing the sound. Trying to determine its source, I lowered my ear toward the vat of bubbling oil. That's when I detected movement. The fries I just lowered into that were now twisting and coiling. Not imagine a jumbled, snaking mass of slender finger, a size maggots. I watched unblinking and unbelievingly as the suddenly active fries started to warm their way over the rims of the fry baskets towards the sides of the vat. Then, using the combined mass against the edge of the vat, they started to form numerous chains to boost themselves out of the oil. The first fries in each chain broke free of the oil surface. The wine began to grow in the pitch and volume, as if a jet engine was throttling up for takeoff. Again, I glanced around to see if any other crew member was hearing the sound, but they all went about their business as if fry uprising wasn't in progress. I stood over the vat. I stood over the vat of escape-minded fries and did what any McDonald's fry cook or trained chimp would do. I started to shove the fries back down into that with a spatula. The response from the fries was instant. I started to quicken. Their pace out of the vat, their ears splitting wine quickly, morphing into the angry hiss of air bleeding from a gashed tire. I grabbed a second spatula and went to work, shoving and slapping and pounding the fries back into the oil picture, a violent game of whack-a-mole between a frantic fry cook and hundreds of sentient french fries. Oil was being splattered everywhere as the angrily hissing fries went plunging back again and again, their twisting mounds growing faster and more desperate to scale the size of the cooking fat. I was working up a mighty sweat as Aaron droplets of oil stung my forearms and neck, every inch of my exposed skin. Yet the battle waged on as ludicrous as it sounds. For every drop with a sizzle against my skin, my mind grew stronger. My body seemed to be using the pain to hypercharge my thoughts, blocking out the tactile sensations, the few of my cognition. So just as the struggle reached its most fevered pitch, Time seemed to slow down. I could see everything happening in slow motion, each surgically placed swipe of my spatula, making contact against every squirming ladder of fries. And I began to wonder why this uprising was happening now of all the lunch shifts of all the McDonald's in the world. Why now maybe it had something to do with the oil. I knew from Mr. Sloan's training that McDonald's uses Olea Canola oil because it has no trans fat, while also boasting the lowest saturated fat of any vegetable oil. Or maybe it had something to do with the Luther Burbank, the famed botanists who developed the russet Burbank potato. The most common mainstay for McDonald's fries, perhaps a combination of Ole Canola oil and Russia Burbank potato was causing the uprising. 
ding the friar's three-minute timer sounded, and suddenly I was aware that all activity in the friar had ceased. He stared into the vat, scanning and re-scanning the fries, but they all floated motionless on the oil surface, all brown and crispy. Finally blinked Todd, need a large fry for the drive through Big Tony stood at the drive through window, impatiently motioning with his hand, not during the move of muscle. I just kept my eyes trained on the fries. I didn't trust them. They were only playing dead. Tony ambled over to the fryer and dumped both baskets into the heated bin. As he sprinkled them with a salt shaker, he gave my forearms a look. Over, you're getting some reading there. Todd, you're supposed to be wearing sleeves. He then scooped a load of golden crispy fries into a large fry sleeve and bagged it up. I watched him hand deliver the bag to the waiting motorist. It was a haggard-looking mother and a minivan with two crab-ass kids in the back seat. The mother plucked the large fries from the bag and handed it back to her kids. Grabby hands. Then the minivan pulled away. I watched his brake lights as it waited to exit the parking lot. My whole body suddenly unclenched. Perhaps the uprising had been a figment of my imagination. Maybe the fumes off the fire had messed with my head. I'd have to do a Google search on Ole Canola Oil. The minivan suddenly did something suspicious, shot in the traffic and then made a very reckless U-turn back into our parking lot. I could feel my jaw tighten in my gonad shrivel with mounting tread. I watched the vehicle pull into the nearest handicap spot. Then the mother and kids entered the store. Both kids were now calm and polite. The mother appeared pleasant and relaxed. If I had to describe them a single word, vegetative, they approached the counter as Mr. Sloan made a beeline for the register. Hello, welcome to McDonald's. How may I help you, one large fry? Of course, Todd. One large fry, my eyes. Batted between the fry bin and the placid-faced mother, and kids, something in my gut was warning me not to fill that order. Todd, large fries, please. Um, sorry. Mr. Sloan, only one order of fries per customer. Are you trying to be funny? Todd. Mr. Sloan exchanged a look with Dick. Tony Todd. It's okay. Big Tony scooped another large fry and delivered it to the mother. Then she and her kids gorged themselves the kind of savage feeding frenzy you'd see on a nature special with a mother lioness cubs. Having taken down a gazelle when it was over, everyone licking their lips and fingers of a salty residue. The mother looked up. Another large fry, please. Now, Mr. Sloan and Big Tony were catching a whiff of the crazy that I'd already sniffed. I'm sorry, Mr. Sloan replied, giving them his most grappling smile. Only two orders of fries per customer. The mother's face went blank. Vegetative. Oh, that's a shame. What kind of potato were those fries made from russet? Burbank. What kind of oil were they cooked in canola? And lastly, whose arm hair was in the fryer? Then Mr. Sloan, Big Tony, the mother and her kids all turned their gaze on my arms, my bare red splashed oil singed arms. Mr. Sloan, a Big Tony suddenly scolded me as the mother and her kid looked hungrily at my arm's flesh. Bravo, Todd, the mother said. Your French fries are positively life-giving. We can't wait to see what you cook up next. And she and her kids exited orderly and drove away. Todd, Mr. Sloan grumbled when you're operating the fryer. Don't worry, Mr. Sloan, I'm never working the fryer again. I quit. I walked out. Never looked back, never had another fry, and never caused another uprising. There's a fourth fact that keeps me up at night. Donald sells nine million pounds of fries a day. I started working for McDonald's during my sophomore year of high school and was still working there five years after my graduation. My grades hadn't been enough to earn me a scholarship and I wasn't in a hurry to go into debt just to make a little more than I was making. Now I figured I could bide my time, climb the corporate structure. 
and eventually go from a minimum wage part-timer to a manager that all changed the day. I met the hair murderer. It's hard to remember specifics when you work a job like McDonald's. Its mundane repetition exemplified the day didn't feel different from any other. I had just finished the lunch rush from 11 to 1. I was enjoying the lull in foot traffic. A few customers were sitting in the lobby, the bulk of commerce now at the drive through window. Then he walked in proper rubble. I blinked as the man walked through the door. He was short and squat with a tuft of red hair peeking out from the brim of his large black hat. Large ears found the size of his face and bucked teeth hung over his lips even with his mouth closed. His shirt and pants were black and white stripes, while large tie decorated with cheeseburgers flowed past his knees. It took me a while to recognize his get-up as the Hamburglar, one of McDonald's forgotten mascots I hadn't seen since childhood. He crept up to the table, stucking behind trash cans and peeking out his head to examine the customer's orders. Me and the other employees behind the counter laughed, wondering if it was some promotion that Corpora had set up without telling us a few customers thought the same as they pulled out their cell phones and started recording. He tiptoed to a table with a lone stoner in his late thirties who somehow missed his entrance. The Hamburglar, standing on his left side, oomed behind him, then tapped the man's right shoulder. When his bloodshot eyes turned in that direction, the Hamburglar swiped the unopened big. Mac from his table. Robin, he screamed again and shoved the Big Mac into his mouth. The sandwich was too big, of course, and it was obliterated. Pickles and breadcrumbs fell to the ground, while the man made gnashing noises cupping the sides of his face to catch the remains of the burger. It took about three seconds, leaving his mouth smeared with grease and special sauce. The display was so sickening that I questioned the man's origins. Corporate might promote a stunt like this, but wouldn't want to make the customers uncomfortable or compensate them for lost food. I suspected he was some online prankster. So I leaned over the counter looking for somebody, besides the customers recording him, but I couldn't see anyone, another. One of the customers was a single mother with two children, a boy and a girl about six and four years old. The mother was smiling as she examined who the hamburger was. The boy guarded its cheeseburger a little closer, but the little girl stretched out one of her chicken nuggets in his direction. The hamburger tiptoed over to them, sniffed up the nugget, and turned his head and wretched, spun on his heel in a twirl, smacking the little girl's hands so hard the sound filled the restaurant. The nugget flew through the air, bounced off a window. Drew, I look like the nugget burglar. He's a child's face. I'm the hamburglar. Rubber. Rubble. Silence briefly filled the room before the girl broke down in the hysterical sobs. This was taking his prank too far. The mother stared at him and gasped as she pulled her daughter close and whispered soothing words while glaring daggers at the man. The older brother stared along. The Hamburglar snatched the half-eaten burger from his hand and crammed it into his mouth, licking the grease from his fingers as he finished. Glenn, our manager, watched everything from behind the counter with us. Like everyone else, he was initially amused until the Hamburglar's interaction with the family. Glenn hefted his belt over his hanging stomach as the boy sniffled and walked to the table. Usually he was pretty laid back, but his... Entire face was red even up through his receding hairline. All right, buddy, that's enough. Get the hell out of my store. He shoved a beefy finger into the much smaller men's chest before looking at the woman. Ma'am... I'm so sorry this man is not an employee, nor is he affiliated with the company in any way. I'll be happy to calm. And before Glenn could say anything, the Hamburglar stepped before him, standing on his tiptoes to put a hand on one of Glenn's shoulders. At first, I thought he was going to kiss him or something. It didn't make any sense, but neither did any of his strange behavior. 
Instead, four small explosions preceded dark red stains on the back of Glenn's shirt before it collapsed lifelessly to the ground, and the Hamburglar's hand was a smoking revolver. Yo screamed and pointed the gun at me. You know what I want? Wobble rubble. The sight of the gun froze me in place while my co-workers all ran to the back entrance. As he stoned toward me, the customers rushed out of the restaurant, leaving their food forgotten in their mad dash to safety. I wasn't about to die for eight dollars an hour, so I emptied my register into a bag and set it on the counter. The Hamburglar peered into the bag and then sneered in disgust before smacking the bag away. Burgers! Give me all your burgers! What I asked in shock, but he fired the gun in the air and sprang me into action. I spun around and pulled all of the burgers off the line and put them in the paper bags. Big Mac's quarter pounders, even small ones from our value menu. My hands trembled, dropping one of the burgers to the floor, another gunshot. Maybe Jump the bullet drove through the McFlurry machine, leaving a gaping hole dripping ice cream. I could easily imagine the same hole in my stomach leaking out my guts. Finish the last bag and set them on the counter. Do you want fries with that? I cringe at the stupid question my training had hammered it into me so hard that it came out as a reflex. The robber's face tightened in rage as he raised the gun to my head. So close I could see Glenn's blood staining the barrel. I cried and begged, but it didn't stop them from pulling the trigger click. Lucky you, he said, as the strength went out from my legs, and the front of my pants grew hot and wet as I lost control of my bladder. The Hamburglar grabbed the bags and skipped toward the door. He spun on his heels, smiled, and saluted me with the gun rabble. Rubble, the police never caught him, and I haven't stepped foot in McDonald's ever since. 